Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful that we have your Spirit, the Spirit of God, to teach us all things. So thankful that we have your Word. We are so aware of our limitations in our understanding. I just pray that you would filter out all of that which is foolish, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Well, we've got our work cut out for us. We've come to uh, the third chapter of 1 Corinthians, in which, which we've been studying verse by verse. And in our last study together, uh, we had... Uh, come to the end of chapter 2 that we have the mind of Christ now I want to just let you all know that this particular uh, five verses that I think that uh, at least I'm hoping we're going to get through the first five verses of chapter 3 has really run me ragged uh, it is of the utmost concern on my part that what I'm about to uh, to share with you here as far as my understanding of this passage is the correct one. And as usual, I do not ask anyone to agree with me, but I, th I think we've got our work cut out for us. I hope you'll bear with me. Uh, this is going to be a little tricky on my part. Uh, I'm not usually... Uh, I'm not usually accustomed to facing uh, such difficult passages of thi as this, and I think there is a, a complexity to it, but I also believe that there is a simplicity to it. I want to point out several things that I've noticed uh, as I've come to the text uh, to try to begin chapter 3 that I think are vitally important for us to keep in mind as we go forward. Uh, I also want to tell you that I have incorporated uh, several uh, tools into this presentation, which I think, at least I hope, will help you better keep track of my thoughts as I go along in trying to explain these verses as I see them. doesn't make me right, uh, but uh, as we know, as we've learned from this uh, study so far, the Holy Spirit will filter out all of that which is foolish, and He will seal to our hearts that which is truth. So I don't have any worry about that in that regard, but uh, I would like to uh, think and believe that uh, my interpretation of this is what the thought that the Holy Spirit had in mind when He wrote this, because we are not looking at the logic of Paul, the feelings of Paul, but primarily we're looking at the words of God, the Holy Spirit, the author of this, in which he used Paul in all of his, uh, all of Paul's uh, personality, his characteristics, his expressions to uh, present the truth of his word. So one, the first thing that I want us to look at here uh, as we go through this is how that chapter the end of chapter 2 and the, and the beginning of chapter 3 is connected by the word and uh, now the, the King James version it, it has this uh, word and here uh, of course, in the Greek, it's also there. I, I checked to make sure that it's also there. Uh, the word chi in the Greek is and. So that is a connecting uh, conjunction that continues the thought from, from the last verse of chapter 2 into the first verse of chapter 3. If we go back here uh, to, uh, and uh, bear with me, I'm because I'm just now getting used to uh, 
I'm just now getting used to this tool here. This this tool is one in which I can I can really circle things that that uh, will help you keep track of, of my thoughts and where I'm at on all this. Uh, if we go back uh, to the to the last verse of uh, and let's see if I can do that. Not sure I can switch pages here. Yeah, here we go. This is the uh, we're looking at the second chapter here. We're going to go down to the last verse. It's uh, this last verse is very important, I believe, because what we're looking at here with this is, and once again, I apologize for my lack of. Uh, of uh, understanding of this new uh, tool I'm using. This verse 16, for who hath known the mind of the Lord? Uh, who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now we know Christ is God, so I think it is appropriate to, to translate that, that we have the mind of God. We have God's mind. Now I want you to keep in, in mind the fact that Paul is speaking to Christians. He's speaking to believers. He's not speaking to the natural man. He's speaking to those who are spiritual, those who have been born of God. And so uh, he's telling these Corinthians that they have the God's mind. Now how how do we interpret that? Well, I suggest that what he's what the Holy Spirit means by that is that the only way that we can have the mind of God, the only way that we can have the mind of Christ is to have his word. So he's telling the Corinthians that that they have the truth. They possess the truth. Now, I understand also that the church was new at this time and that the Bible, they didn't have a Bible as we uh have a Bible. Uh, they didn't, uh, you know, this was at the beginning of, uh, of the church. The church was new at the time. Revelation, the, the canon had not been complete, but nevertheless, the words that, that Paul spoke uh, through the Holy Spirit, or, or the Holy Spirit spoke through Paul, uh, were, were very much the mind of God concerning all of these matters. And so uh, this is connected by that conjunction and uh, we have God's mind, okay, is what he says. We have God's mind. And if We have God's mind and verse one of chapter three and I brethren. Now, this also confirms the fact that he's talking to believers. I brethren could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. And we're going to stop right there a moment and we're going to think about this for a moment. Uh, the common conception, I think, among many Bible teachers today, uh, many of the commentators, is that uh, there were those Corinthians there at Corinth, uh, believers in the body of Christ at Corinth. Some were spiritual, some were carnal. Some were uh, not spiritual. I do not think that that is what the text is saying. I'm going to suggest that uh, there is a every reason to believe that these individuals that we're looking at Paul speaking to in verse 1 of chapter 3 are spiritual. He's not saying that they are not spiritual. He's not saying that at all. He's saying that he couldn't speak to them as unto spiritual. And I think that is an important point, uh, an important fact to consider as we go forward as well. 
Uh, they are not the natural men that we read about in chapter 2 who could not discern the things of the Spirit, that, that they were foolish uh, to them. Uh, these are believers. These are brethren. He's uh, writing to this church. And another thing to I, I believe it is vitally important to take into consideration is the actual context in which he's this is Paul himself speaking to a body of believers, uh, a church, uh, uh, an organized uh, gathering, uh, a body of believers in a specific location or a specific region called Corinth. So uh, I think we need to be careful when we come to this verse and not just automatically assume that uh, we can't speak on an individual one-on-one -on -one basis to one another uh, in the way that Paul is is uh, is referring to here. In other words, I meet a brother on the street, uh, and I can't speak unto him as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. Uh, that I make some distinction uh, there between uh, myself and him. You know, I'm spiritual, he's carnal, or or, or we take that, we bring that down to an individual lev level, which to me removes us from the context of the Apostle Paul uh, speaking to this church. We are not Paul, and we are not uh, a collective body of believers uh, receiving something from Paul. Uh, if we take that and reduce that down, uh, or maybe there's a second application. I'll admit that there may be a secondary application when it comes to our interacting with one another individually, but I just need feel the need to point out that in, in order to remain true to the context, this is Paul speaking to a body of believers in a specific region. He's speaking to a church. And so uh, I'll just go ahead and put this right up front here for your consideration. I think that what we're going to find out when we go through this passage is, is that we are very much living this passage. We are either on one side of the equation or we are on the other in our interaction with other believers. But again, I stress the fact that this is Paul speaking to a church. It's not individual Christians speaking to other Christians. But I do believe that we are going to either find ourselves on one side of the aisle or, or the other. Uh, he couldn't speak unto them as unto spiritual. He's, he's not saying they weren't spiritual, but that he couldn't speak unto them as unto spiritual. And I will also suggest that the word speak there is not as much, uh, doesn't carry as much the connotation of, of well, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you certain things. There are certain things I couldn't tell you. Now, now, maybe to a certain degree that's true, but I don't think that's how the Holy Spirit is using the word speak. I think the way the Holy Spirit is using the word speak here is that I couldn't commune with you, fellowship with you on that basis, on, on the basis of the fact that we uh, were in agreement, that, uh, that uh, you know, I had to speak to you as those in which there was some division that existed between us, and that division uh, Paul, I think, would have said is not a, is not a fault of my own, but because that you were uh, carnal. Now, in looking at the word carnal there in the text, uh, what I want to do here is I want to I, I want to actually go through uh, this in the interlinear, which is, you know, the translation of the Greek New Testament. And I, brothers. Uh, see if I can get myself in trouble again with this new tool. And I, brothers, uh, I believe that's extremely important. That he's speaking to brothers. Uh, not was able. The word there, able, is is basically uh, power. Paul is saying, I didn't have the ability. I didn't even have the ability to speak. The power to commune to you on the basis of the fact that you were spiritual. Uh, even though I, I, I will continue to insist 
that these believers were very much spiritual. They were, uh, they were born of God, uh, but as unto fleshly as to infants in Christ. And, of course, now everybody's kind of familiar with the phrase babe in Christ, okay? This brother over here, he's a babe in Christ. This brother over here, he's a grown-up in Christ. He's a he's mature. He's an adult in Christ. He's not a babe uh, in Christ, and that is very much true. We have babes, and we have, we have infants in Christ, uh, and we have those who are more mature, and that is a, a fact that can't be argued. However, however, what I would uh, suggest for your, uh, uh, for your thinking here is, is that uh, what Paul is saying, and I, brethren, didn't have the ability, didn't have the power to commune with you on the basis of the fact that you were spiritual, uh, but as unto fleshly. And that word fleshly, I want you to take and note this word. I'll... Uh, I'll highlight this again, this, the word there in the Greek, fleshly, it's, uh, uh, it's sarkonos or sarkonois. Uh, there's variations of that word, and we're going to find two, uh, two times this is mentioned, the word fleshly or carnal, as the King James translates it. We'll see this mentioned twice, at least twice. And but both of these mentions are not the exactly the same word. And I think that's important to notice as well. Uh, this word fleshly that I've highlighted in red that you see here in red is, uh, is basically means uh, the, the hide on my, on my body, the flesh, the, literally the flesh, okay? Uh, what you're looking at right here, the flesh. Uh, that is literally what the word means. I couldn't speak to you as unto spiritual, but as unto just mere men, uh, those in the flesh. Uh, and then he, and he, he goes on to say as, as uh, to infants in Christ, babes in Christ. Now, I want you to stop and think for a moment. I, I pointed this out in the past, and I, I hope you took note of it. Uh, we were born of God by, th by a very special process. Uh, we, uh, uh, God illumined our minds, our hearts, our understanding to the truth of the gospel that Christ lived. He, he died, was buried, and raised again on the third day, day all according to the scriptures. Uh, that's the gospel. That's the good news, which, uh, again, you want to take note of the fact that uh, there's, there's nothing in the good news that, that, that suggests that we do anything. It's just the good news that Christ died in our place, a substitutionary death. And uh, so we were born again, and according to John 1.13, born again not by the will of man, but according to the will of God, not the will of the flesh, but according to God. God gave birth to his children, were born from above, and, and, and we were born, and I, I think it's safe to say that, that every Christian uh, moments after he was born, uh, would have been considered, rightly considered, a babe in Christ. My question to you would be, did, did God uh, produce uh, faulty offspring? Did he, uh, or offspring that was less than perfect? Because if he did, then that is not consistent with Scripture, because we are, we have a new man that is perfect, created in righteousness and true holiness, and so uh, I don't, I'm going to suggest that God didn't produce any offspring. It was less than perfect. Uh, uh, the new creation is perfect. It cannot sin. We saw that in our st study in 1 John. And so, but they were acting as, at collectively as a body, they were acting as mere men. Now, I'm going to slip in here a thought here I also want you to consider. And that is that if I believe, and this is just what I believe, I believe if Paul had been uh, present there at Corinth, uh, or when he was present at Corinth, I think that on an individual one-on-one -on -one basis, there were, there had to have been, there must have been, 
I'm going to suggest there must have been some believers there uh, at the church in Corinth uh, to whom he could have spoken to as spiritual. That's what I'm going to suggest. Uh, I don't think that the whole entire body of believers at this specific location, this church, this collective body of believers at Corinth, I don't think that the text is telling us that every single person there at Corinth, every single believer, uh, was carnal. Or that they were infants in Christ. Uh, but he couldn't, at, overall, collectively as a whole, he couldn't speak to them as, un, as unto spiritual. Now, I'm very reluctant to bring in my own personal experience into this or read my own personal experience into these verses. But I will suggest to you this. It, there's no doubt in my mind that there are many churches today that I could walk into or I could, let's, let's be more true to the text, I could write them a letter that, which would say that I could not speak to you as unto spiritual that we don't have that common ground, we don't have that fellowship of commun communion, we don't have that agreement, we're divided, and the reason we're divided is because such and such and such and such, and that's what we're going to find out as we go forward in the text. I want you to take serious note of the fact that uh, uh, of we're looking at believers here who are... Uh, in Christ. So these believers were in Christ. We're not looking at carnal believers, uh, spiritual believers, uh, or we're not looking at spiritual uh, Christians, those born of God, believers in Christ, uh, who are brethren that Paul refers to as brethren. There's, there's not, there is nothing in the text here that indicates that God the Holy Spirit is speaking to those who are not His people that are non-elect, that there's, uh, now I'm not saying that there, there was not tear among the wheat, but what I'm saying is that the Holy Spirit is speaking to his people. I've often pointed out this is a love letter to God's people. Uh, this entire book that we call the Bible is a love letter to God's people. And so we're going to go on forward with this. Uh, I made a few notes here that I want to, I want to make sure that, uh, I also bring into this, we, we saw in the previous chapter that the natural man can't hear. Uh, there, there's an, it's important, I believe, that we understand the difference between a mere propositional revelation and illumined revelation. Uh, we see the words light. We see the words enlightened uh, used often in Scripture. Uh, so faith has to have, folks, faith has to have something to rest upon. And it has to be an illumined revelation or that we are illumined by the Holy Spirit to understand it as God understands it. If we have a wrong interpretation of it, uh, God is not going to illumine error. He's not going to illumine uh, that so-called truth uh, to our lives or seal error to our, our lives or our hearts or our minds. And so... Uh, there's a difference between pro mere propositional revelation, which is just knowledge. You, you're reading uh, a scripture and you gain knowledge, but that does not mean that uh, there's no guarantee here. No word does, in the word does God guarantee that just because you read something and you gain knowledge that God is going to, uh, that he's automatically obligated to grant faith, to trust him, illumine that truth and grant, and then grant faith faith to trust him concerning that truth. He does that at, at, at his own timing. The Holy Spirit guides us. He directs us. Uh, we heard uh, Jesus, uh, we, we hear Jesus say that to his disciples as he's getting ready to go away, that the Holy Spirit would come and he would guide them into all truth. And so uh, we need to sort of, uh, I think we need to consider the, the matter of enlightenment as we go forward. A good example of that would be like Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come unto me, all ye that are labor, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And someone's job and marriage and whatever else is not working out right in their life, and so uh, 
uh, and and they're weary from that, and they 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 just want rest, and 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 so uh, they falsely assume that that what that says is that if they just come to Christ, God will relieve them of all that burden, relieve them of all that pressure, of all that discomfort, all that unhappiness, uh, that discontentment, and whatever circumstances are going through, uh, and that's what that's saying. I don't believe that's what that's talking about at all. I don't think it's talking about physical hardships, but trying to become righteous. If you're trying to become righteous in your own strength, on your own, uh, through your own efforts, uh, uh, then you need to uh, come unto Him. Uh, you that labor and are heavy laden, and He'll give you rest. And that is, you'll come to understand that you actually are have been made the righteousness of God in Christ. Spiritual discernment is necessary in the life of the believer. So there's no chapter division at the end of chapter 2 and 3. Uh, he's, he's speaking to brethren. He's speaking to those who are spiritual. There's no question but that they are spiritual. He just can't speak unto them as unto spiritual. It's a specific body of believers. It's plural there in the grammar. Uh, and I think individuals speaking to one another would be a little different. It's, it's, and it's not really as much speaking as in telling them things, but it, it's communion. It's speaking in the sense that you have communion, you have fellowship, you're of the same mind. Didn't we read back in previous verses that they were to be of the same mind? Yes, we did. Uh, and this word and stands in between chapter 2 and 3. We have the mind of Christ or we have God's mind. And, and so, you know, what Paul is saying, we have, we have God's mind. These carnal fleshly Corinthians, we all have God's mind. And I could not converse with you on that basis. I think that's what the text is saying. Now, if you have a different view, that's fine. That's, that's how I'm reading it. But as babes, as infants to whom I gave milk... Okay, and um, we're going to look at that. Milk was what they needed. Uh, I think I'm starting to get a little used to this, uh, this little uh, marking tool here. So we'll continue using that. Of course, now, no, note that the Greek reads a little different, obviously. It reads a little different than the English. So you're going to, you're going to, this is why many of the, much of the time, a, a verse that when we rightly interpret it, it doesn't sound anything like the, the, the translations. But uh, milk you I gave to drink, not solid food. For not yet were you able, again, we see the same word. Just as Paul didn't have the ability, the power to speak unto them as unto spiritual, they didn't have the ability or the power, okay, uh, to eat or consume solid food. I spent a lot of time, I have spent a lot of time the past several days just meditating on thinking about what is milk, what is meat, okay? If we look at milk as, as something, well, that's it's a little less than, 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 uh, in, of, in value as meat, I think we're looking at that wrong. Both are milk and meat are intended to nourish us believers in Christ. Uh, the purpose for both is nourishment. Uh, a babe in Christ does need milk. It doesn't need meat. It's not hard to illustrate that fact. Just take an infant and try to give him a piece of steak. When he doesn't have teeth, he can't chew it. He can't eat it. Uh, in the same sense, in the spiritual sense of, of, of uh, all of this, the same is true of us. Uh, Jesus said that he, wouldn't, he had many more things to say to his disciples, but they couldn't bear them now. Uh, I believe that's in John chapter 16. I could be wrong about that, but I think that's in chapter 16. And he says, you're still not able. You still don't have the ability. You still don't have the power. I don't see anything condescending in this. That's number one. I do not, see, in any shape, form, or fashion, do I see the Holy Spirit. Uh, he's not being condescending to those who could not eat meat. Uh, that's important to take into consideration. I think very important. Uh, we don't want to pride ourselves in, 
you know, well, we, you know, we're able to eat meat, but uh, my other, my brother, he's not able to eat meat. So must be something wrong with him. You know, uh, uh, if you had a baby in the family and uh, you were a, a teenager, you were, and, and your, your parents, or let's say you were 10 or 12 years old or 15 years old and your parents had another child, you wouldn't, it wouldn't be appropriate for that young child to look down on, on, uh, on the infant as something less than uh, perfect. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep using that word perfect because I think it entirely fits the context. Dearly beloved, these believers at Corinth were right where where God wanted them to be. They were right where God intended that they be. Were their activities consistent with those who were mature? No, they weren't. But uh, I believe that's. Uh, uh, that's not something that we can look at. I'm going to suggest that's not something that we can look at and say, well, there's just God, God wishes that they were more grown up because, you know, we're going to find out later. It's God who causes the growth. And so uh, let's, let's continue going on forward here with this. This is a, uh, as we, uh, approach verse 3 here. They're still fleshly. Now, this word fleshly is different. It's the same word. It's just a derivative. It's it's a different uh, form of that word. And uh, it's uh, sarkanoi. Now, I'm actually going to try to, let's see if I can do this. I'm going to try to take you to the, actually, to the word here. And I'll read you what it says. In this Greek word, it's it's pertaining to the flesh. It's carnal, fleshly, carnal, earthly. But I want you to take note of what this says. And I'll highlight it right here. It's uh it's it's from 4559 in Strong's. It's a uh, it's a uh, uh, sarcakos. It pertains to behavior which is typical of human nature, but with a special focus upon more base physical desires. Okay, flesh. So it's it's a little more, I don't know, there's two words here for flesh. The second word is a little more fleshly. Okay, it, it doesn't carry the same connotation as, well, in flesh. You know, he's, 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 Paul, I believe, is telling these believers in the first word that we looked at as flesh, that they're they're in flesh, okay? But here, it, it has more of a of a negative connotation. Uh, so I think that's important to uh, take note of also. So we'll go back to uh, the text. Still for fleshly, you are. That's a perfect active indicative. They, uh, that is what they are. Wherefore, uh, among you, there are among you jealousy and strife. Uh, let's stop there with, at the word jealousy. The, the word jealousy is, is, the word literally means to boil over with heat. Okay, if you put a pan of water on the stove and you boil it over, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's hot. It's hot. Uh, this hot jealousy is a boiled over jealousy and this uh, and strife. Uh, the word there uh, in the Greek for strife is uh, uh, quarrel, uh, wrangling, argumentative. So, you know, we're looking at uh, 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 we're looking at words in which the Holy Spirit uses to describe these uh, young believers at Corinth. Uh, in which there was a, a hot boiling over, uh, uh, it, actually the word jealousy there, which is from that word hot boiling over, it can, it can be used both positively and negatively. The positive uh, form of that is zeal, okay? You're enthusiastic, you have great zeal. The negative form of it is, well, it's the same, except it has a negative con connotation. So they're they're zealous, they're enthusiastic, but they're but it's it's a, an enthusiasm which is going in the wrong direction, which uh, is combined with argument very 
uh, very hot, intense arguing, okay, and debating. Uh, and he, he goes on to tell them why. It's because uh, you're walking according to man. Walking according to man. Walking according to the flesh. We know that we, we are to walk according to the Spirit, not according to the flesh. And that's, that's you see, we see that throughout Paul's epistles. Uh, it's uh, that whole concept. In fact, we see that throughout the New Testament. And so, uh, again, I'm, I'm finding nothing to really fault the Corinthians for here uh, because uh, we would have to backtrack folks on a whole lot of truth concerning these beliefs. Keep in mind what God the Holy Spirit through Paul said to these Corinthians, these carnal, fleshly, hot, argumentative, over-enthusiastic in the wrong way Christians. Uh, keep in mind what he said to him in chapter 1 and continuing on in chapter 2. Uh, an enormous amount of grace that was given these believers in which God has nothing against him. He doesn't have anything against you. He doesn't have anything against me. We're looking at a stage of maturity here which in, in which uh, uh, we can't and I hope I say this right, we can't uh, make any forward progress really in the faith as long as we're clinging on to backward error. Uh, that's what I've said. And I've often said before, too, that I believe that theological error precedes moral error, and we see moral error in the lives of the Corinthians here. Uh, and that moral error was only the result of, and this is what I'm going to suggest, it was only the result uh, because they were Christians. They were believers. They were in Christ. It was only the result of a lack of understanding. I've never faulted a believer uh, for a lack of understanding or, or in my life. I've, I've never looked at another brother in Christ and, and thought, well, you know, there's just something wrong with this brother because he's not on the same uh, spiritual level, maturity level as I am or someone else is or, or he's not where I think he should be. And oftentimes, folks, I am, and I am convinced that, that we can look at another brother and we can uh, make the mistake of assuming that he ought to be somewhere else other than where God has placed him at the present time. Well, God may be working in a believer's life in one area. We can take and drag that believer away from what Christ is doing. Uh, and so and that's not a good thing either. Uh, so this uh, so milk was what they needed uh, not meat you know I think Paul is saying that my speaking to you collectively as a specific body of believers in a specific region at this specific time, it couldn't be on a mature level. And I, I don't have any problem with that interpretation. It just feels right to me. It may not feel right to you, but it feels right to me. Though, though they were truly brethren. You know, Paul had to speak to, to them as, not, not as they were not brethren, but, but speak to them as flesh, that is, as mere men. And I believe, folks, that we are all living through this scenario today in one way or another. And we're, we're either on one or the other, uh, one side or the other. We're, we're pictured here as being either on one side or, or the other. Uh, any one of us will either speak to a Corinthian church or, or an Ephesian church or a Galatian church. I mean, keep that in mind. I mean, individually, I suppose we all in some sense speak to our brother in relation to the church that he or she most represents. Uh, but the object of the verb speak is a, ch is a church. Okay, it's a church. And we shouldn't make light of that. There, there are churches to which I could not speak to them as spiritual. Okay, not because they're not, not because they're not spiritual because they are, but because they simply could not bear it, okay? 
And so uh, we've looked at these two uh, different words for flesh. And just keep in mind, dearly beloved, please keep in mind that they were, they were never the natural men incapable of understanding spoken, spoken about at the end of chapter 2. And there are positional uh, and, con and conditional uh, aspects of Christian truth. Uh, positionally, okay, we, we are righteous in Christ. We, that may not always reflect our, our position. Uh, that truth may not always reflect that position that we are positionally righteous in Christ, but we are nonetheless righteous in Christ. Paul isn't saying they're not spiritual, but that he couldn't speak to them as spiritual, and for good reason, because they were unable to bear it. They had no ability, they had no power, okay, to bear it. Uh, that was John 16. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you can't bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Well, is the Holy Spirit guiding these believers in Cor at Corinth into all truth? Well, if he isn't, then he lied. And God's babes are born perfect. They're born complete. We are complete in Christ. We saw that in Colossians. There aren't spiritual Christians. There aren't carnal Christians. There's only spiritual Christians who act carnal fleshly. We are spiritual. We're not carnal. Uh, we're not our old man. Uh, we saw when we went through Colossians that we, we put off the old man. We put on the new man. That's Colossians uh, chapter 3. Uh, Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. So these Corinthians, they may not have realized that they had put off the old man, but uh, I assure you that if they were in Christ, they had put off the old man with his deeds. And they had put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. I'm going to suggest that if Paul had, had told these carnal Christians directly that they didn't possess the ability to stop sinning, he would have been speaking the truth. Uh, he didn't, and note that he just didn't come right out and say, hey, you know, you guys, you need to stop this nonsense. You need to stop this arguing. You need to stop this, this bickering with one another. You need to stop this. Well, why didn't he just do that? Well, because that would have been a law. Uh, that, it is not the Holy Spirit's intention of putting you under law and just giving you an instruction and saying, okay, you just do this or you stop doing this. What the Holy Spirit does is go about it in a graceful way and explain to them why they're doing what they're doing. And then grace, the, the grace of growing and grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ then becomes a, a bedrock truth uh, reality in their life, uh, in their experience. It's not that they're not growing in grace and knowledge of Christ. I believe every single believer is growing in grace and knowledge of Christ, but they're doing it at God's own pace. They're not doing it at, at their pace. They're not doing it at my pace or, or your pace or 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 anything like that. Uh, imagine that, you know, given the fact that they were carnal, they were fleshly, physically, and, and they often behaved like it, uh, but they were not told to simply just straighten up their behavior. I mean, that's, that's law. Now, in looking at milk and meat, I think it helps to keep in mind this milk and meat was mentioned elsewhere. If we go back to uh, to Hebrews chapter 5, uh, verse 11, of whom we have many things to say and are, and, are, and, are, and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. The first uh, principles of the oracles of God. Uh, for everyone that uses milk, is unskillful in the word of righteousness. The word of righteousness. Notice he doesn't say that for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word. It says in, unskillful in the word of righteousness. For he's a babe, but strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even though who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. 
in Hebrews chapter 6, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permit. You're looking at some of the basic principles of the faith there, uh, repentance, uh, faith toward God, the doctrine of, of identification, uh, of, of the laying on of hands. That is, uh, you don't want to share in the sins of others by laying on hands on them too quickly. Uh, and of, of uh, you know, a value or placing them in a sort of a, or, or categorizing them, labeling them as being something that they're really not. And of resurrection of the dead. Uh, and of eternal judgment. Uh, there is no judgment for those of us in Christ. But this we will do, says the writer of Hebrews, if God permits. Uh, we need to face the fact, uh, as, as, as awful as it might seem on the surface, that there are some that God does not permit to go on to maturity. The text clearly says that. Hebrews 6.1, or Hebrews 6.3. Hebrews 6.3, not everyone's going to go on to maturity. It's only those that God permits to go on to maturity. Now, if you want to know why that is, you probably have to take that up with him. I, I couldn't give you a direct answer on that. But uh, Christian uh, spirituality, uh, if, uh, inexperience, is, is the realization of who we are in Christ positionally, and that that position doesn't change, that we are eternally secure. It's a, it is a conscious, uh, uh, the consciousness of fellowship with the Spirit of Christ, where there's never any condemnation, or that we trust God in relationship to the truth that He's illumined to our hearts, that He's sealed to our hearts, or that we, we then also reckon, Romans 6, 11, reckon yourselves dead to sin, but alive unto God in Christ. It's a walk that's really uninterrupted by the manifestation of the old man or the characteristics of the outward expressions of the old man. Uh, fellowship need not be interrupted uh, because of that. That's the provision that God made through reckoning in Romans chapter 6. Uh, in 1 John, we saw we're being cleansed of all sin as we walk in the light. So as we walk in the light, we have. We're being cleansed of all sin. That means we're sinning as we walk in the light. I pointed that out in 1 John. We're not cleaning up the old man. Uh, Paul's not expecting these Corinthians to just merely clean up the flesh. That would be taking his ministry in the wrong direction, putting them back under law, not grace. Uh God has nothing to do with the old man. The old man was crucified with Christ. So we, we don't show favoritism as it concerns who we follow, elders, Bible teachers, whatever label you want to place on them. Uh, please don't do that with me. Don't, don't say, you know, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a Sewellite. I'm a, I'm a blessed hope forever, right? I'm a, I'm a, uh, you know, I follow Steve. I, uh, it is not, it, I am a messenger through whom perhaps you believed. Okay. Uh, the body of Christ is not divided. We saw that in the previous chapter. And we preach nothing but Christ and Him crucified. If, if some of these uh, Corinthians were uh, positionally carnal, fleshly, well, that, that, that would mean they didn't have a new, a new creation. They weren't really believers. Um, so, uh, in, in Romans six eleven, reckoning wouldn't make a lick of sense. Uh, a focus on Christ and Him crucified. That is that is keeping ourselves pure. You're not looking to add anything to the the person and the work of Christ. Uh, you're you're not pushing Christ down and and pushing man up. Uh, uh, so, in that sense, you're keeping yourselves pure, because you are pure. Uh, it's We live as who we are. This is why I've always believed that uh, 
the church overall as a whole is suffering from an identity crisis. It really just doesn't know who it is. And we can't discuss carnality apart from law, fleshly uh, carna carnality, which is the very strength of sin. Law is what gives sin its power, folks. Law is what gives sin its strength. Uh, that's the wisdom of the world that we saw that we're, we're not a part of. Uh, the wisdom of the world. It's, and that is a focus on man. It's a focus on men, on man, on self, on uh, personal effort, uh, uh, personal ability, human, uh, human performance, human ability. That's the wisdom of the world. Uh, it, it's a focus on all of that and not Christ. So, you know, that term babe in Christ is not a derogatory term. But neither is milk doctrine uh, weakened down. Well, that's, you know, that's doctrine that's just weakened down, you know, or diluted. You know, uh, milk can't be something other than doctrine, okay? I suggest milk is foundational truth. Uh, it's a beginning nourishment without which meat has nothing to build upon. Uh, uh, for no one can lay a foundation, uh, verse 11 is going to say, other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. You know, you, you show me a house without a foundation, I'll show you a church in Corinth, okay? I mean, now, I'm, don't misunderstand me. The foundation was laid, the foundation was Christ. It's just they weren't building on that. They were building on one another, okay? And who they favored and who they thought, you know, was better than someone else. There was a lot of arguing, bickering, hot, debated arguments and bickering, according to the text. There was a lot of arguing going on over who was, who was right, who was, you know, who was, who we should, who they should follow, who they shouldn't. Uh, so, uh, you know, it could be that we've just turned this all around as well. That wouldn't surprise me. We've turned around so much of God's Word into, from we turned it from God to man. Uh, uh, milk is fundamental, foundational truth. It has to be. It's not something other than uh, that which is nourishing. Uh Knowing what God's done for us in Christ, He being the foundation upon which God's building is being built. We're not doing the building. We're going to see that. So I'm just kind of giving you a little preview of what we're going to be looking at ahead here. You know, uh, I'm not, I can't say meat's growing in grace and knowledge of Christ and milk is not. I can't say that. I think both are nourishing and both do that. But the, the natural mind, uh, man, the natural mind, the fallen mind of natural man, he doesn't find nourishment in either milk or meat. Truth is Christ. Uh, truth is also absolute. It's not relative. You're going to hear a lot today that truth is relative. Well, you got your truth and I got my truth. Truth is absolute. And uh, I'll say it again. Theological error precedes moral error. Uh, so therefore, the absence of truth is clearly linked to a moral behavior, or fleshly or carnal behavior. These Corinthians, I think they needed to know that Christ's work was sufficient from day one. The foundation had been laid. The very gospel itself declares that sufficiency. The gospel is not just some factual set of events that occurred making it possible for you to save yourself if, if you just, you know, somehow apply yourself. Or, or dot all your I's and cross all your T's. If it doesn't proclaim that his work is sufficient, it's not the gospel. It's something else. It's something other than the gospel. In verse 10 of this chapter, we're going to read, According to the grace of God, having been given to me as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation, that is Christ, but another is building upon it. But let each one take heed how he builds upon it. Folks, we build on Christ, okay? These Corinthians, they needed milk. They needed milk, not meat. And so, enter Paul. And, uh, and we know that Paul had spoken to the Corinthians before in Acts, I believe Acts chapter 18. But, uh, you know, Revelation was new at the time. 
the writer of Hebrews stressed the need to go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation which had been laid. Milk that Peter said uh, that we should crave if we are to be delivered. You know, if we who are redeemed should want to be delivered, we need to crave that milk, that solid foundation. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, that laying on of hands, that's, that's hastily appointing elders or, or, or pastors, you know. You know, here in Corinthians, it's, you know, I'm, I am a Paul, I am a, of Apollos, I am of Cephas. And notice he mentions this twice. He, in fact, uh, it would probably be a good idea if I went back here. To, uh, well, let's, let's start all over here. Let's go back to the King James. See if I can get on straightened out on the right path here. We'll go back to two here. Uh, bear with me here. Uh, Or maybe it's 110 that I'm looking for. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. This is the King James. Uh, I'll highlight this. And uh, we'll see what this does. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, how can we be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment? Well, because uh, uh, we have His Word. It's, it's only His Word that would allow us to do that. And he goes on here, he goes on to say here, uh, the same thing that we're looking at in chapter 3, you know. Uh, every one of you says, I am of Paul and I of Apollos. And now notice he says, every one of you says, all right, every one of you. Every, this is verse 12, every one of you says. I really got to learn how to use this tool. Every one of you says. I am of Paul and I am of Paulus and I of Cephas and I of Christ. Okay, so there were those there who were saying I'm of Christ. Okay. So, so we can't say that, it, and this is just my opinion, we can't say that every one of these individuals we're looking at that he's speaking to here, especially in chapter 3 here, not, he's not saying that there were not some there that he couldn't uh, uh, give, give meat to, okay? Uh, there were, that there were not, that they were just collectively as a whole, every single believer there at that specific uh, church in Corinth was fleshly that's uh, we can't we can't come to that conclusion there were those who were saying uh clearly saying uh that they were of christ so uh, we don't want to we don't want to share in the sins of others by uh you know, laying hands too quickly on, on Paul or, or Apollos or Steve or, or whoever. We are a, uh, we're a very unique creature. We're a dwelling place for God in Christ in which the Word becomes flesh again. Once more, the Word becomes flesh in His body. Uh, God's building, a spiritual house with, uh, which, uh, with, with its head, the Lord Jesus Christ, it makes one perfect man. And, and as the head, Christ becomes the Savior of the body. 
uh, the children of God, these, you know, us being uh, his children, uh, we are literally, quite literally, created cells of living tissue uh, that, that are, uh, we're a race of homo sapiens that is distinctly different from the natural man. God, God contrasts that quite well. Uh, we are, uh, we're not little Christs running around everywhere, but, but we are a single Lord. Uh, his body is, is bon we're bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. We are so much a part of himself that though now and then our faith fails and we deny him, he can't deny us. And the reason he can't deny us is because we are his body. Uh, so he can't deny himself. And these, these two species of homo sapiens, they confront one another as light confronts darkness. You know, we recognize other believers uh, when we uh, see, most, most often, that is, we do. You know, we recognize one another, and the world does. It recognizes its, recognizes its own people. Uh, I recognize my brother in Christ. Uh, uh, and uh, that's, we were given that ability from, I believe, from birth or new birth to do that. And in some people, it's, it's more refined, I think, highly refined than in others. Uh, but, you know, even the world recognizes that this new creation is not of it. It's not of itself. You know, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. And and uh, and even though sometimes it may envy us, nevertheless, it does feel at ease uh, with itself. It doesn't. It feels ill at ease with, uh, around us in our presence, or it feels condemned by it, by our presence. And we can work together in many ways, you know, the world, God gives a common grace. Uh, it can work together in harmony in many ways for the common good. But the hindrance, the biggest hindrance to that harmony is seen when members of either species pretend to be what they are not. Uh, we're getting a glimpse of that a little bit here among the believers at Corinth. It's when the man of the world pretends to be a Christian or the Christian tries to identify with the world. We're going to get more deeper into this, I think, as, as time goes by. I want to take a moment to thank you all from the bottom of my heart for your continued participation with me in these studies. I'm really enjoying them. I hope you are, too. I want to thank you all for your messages. I read every one. I really appreciate your comments. Even though I may not respond, I really do appreciate them, and I appreciate all of your support. Uh, until next time, folks, rest in Him. He loves you with a love that's everlasting. Until then, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.